Hi, good day. Welcome to the Store and Try Vow Fellowship. It's a blessing to have all of you who are here with us in person. Uh, my daughter Jeannie and her family are back from California. It's a blessing to have them. It's a blessing to have you all joining us online. We are going to have a good service today. I'm excited about the service today. Um, all of, you know stuff that has already gone on. Uh, you know, before we actually started recording the, or uh, rolling the film here, so to speak, uh, the devil's been playing a hard one for this service. Uh, even this morning, stuff going on, and you know, Satan really has a, a way of getting a hold of you. If any of you, you're ever driving to church, and you know, it seems like World War III always breaks out in the way uh, while you're on the way to church, or everything that could go wrong that morning went wrong, so that the devil can get you out of sorts, so that you're not hearing from the Word of God. I pray that will not be the case today. Day. We're going to have a good service. Uh, this is the, the last week of our main services of our Operation Heal America Revival Series. Uh, last year, technically, last week was supposed to be our fifth and final week, but um, it was actually not uh, last week, but the last time we had it because we had a break there. Uh, but there was... Um, no sooner was that service done, I had an immediate conviction that I needed to preach a little bit more. And the next day, the Lord gave me this sermon. So I've had it for a couple of weeks now, uh, just developing it and putting it on paper, doing my last touches. But I've had it in my mind. Uh, the Lord convicted me hard. The Lord convicted me strong. Uh, the Holy Spirit slammed me like a tongue of bricks, hit my chest, and said, You need to preach this service today. So if anyone here or listening online... Uh, you get something out of it, or if it convicts you a little bit, uh, just just so you all know, um, you know, nothing was intended to, to hit anyone deliberately or, or for any reason. If it does or should it, the Lord laid this on me, and this is what we're going to do because we're going to honor God. Amen. And so today's service is called a family reformation. Our last service in in the Operation Heal America revival series was on repentance, um, talking about you know, turning from your sins and 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 uh, getting your heart right and living your life in such a way. Sorry, looking for my cup. Living your life in such a way that God can be able to use us. The verses of Scripture that we are going off for. If you have your Bibles, please open them, please. To the book of Second Chronicles, chapter seven, verse fourteen. I also have the book of Nehemiah ready. Nehemiah will be our text today. It's actually the book of Nehemiah where we get the name from our church from the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship. Is uh, we're going to be talking about Nehemiah building the wall here of Jerusalem, and when they were out there building that wall, the enemies were coming as they were trying to build that wall, and so they they basically had their trial in one hand, laying the mortar for the brick with their sword in the other hand ready to go and where we get our name the sword and trial in fact you might even be able to see it in that video camera the sword that we have hanging up over our window here uh, just an essence of uh, being able to be on that defensive to fight the devil to fight sin to fight unrighteousness and unholiness and ungodliness but at that same time building up the church building up the home and so second chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 is our text Verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, I thank thee for sparing our lives on this side of eternity another day and giving me the opportunity to preach in church again in front of this pulpit. Lord, I pray that that Satan in his early attempts to already hijack this service will be defeated from now on. Dear God in heaven, I pray thee the power of the Holy Ghost of God to fall upon this church, upon this service, and upon me as the preacher. Fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost as I preach, Father. Let me preach with power and authority. Please don't let the devil get anything in here, Lord. And as, and as the Holy Spirit convicts, I pray that people will make the decisions that they need to do in order to honor God and get right with the Lord. Now hide us behind the cross, Father, and fill us with the power of the Holy Ghost of God. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and just for His sake we pray. Amen. Our intro getting into, as I said, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Nehemiah. If you don't know where Nehemiah is, if you're going through the Old Testament of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible. So just go back from there a few books and, and you'll be able to find it. 
Nehemiah will be our text. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, I have a ton of notes. I cannot even imagine and describe. I've never had this many notes for a service before. And I'm trying to cram that all into this hour's time that we have. And, and so I'm, I'm going to actually be reading my notes quite a bit today. And so please don't you know, forgive me for lack of eye contact or anything like that. I want to stick to my script, so to speak. Got a lot of material I need to cover. Very important material. And I don't want to miss it. And I certainly don't want to keep you here longer and make it so you're not you're tired of listening to me or anything. Well, a few years ago, with each passing day, the situation became more and more uh, desperate. War seemed inevitable. England was imposing its crushing tariffs on the colonies. British ships were all across the waters off the shores of New England. There had been skirmishes in Lexington and in Boston. Oh, the colonists had a ragtag little militia in some of the settlements. But the British were coming on more and more strongly. Rumors of war circulated wildly. Believing that war was inevitable, the politicians met in Philadelphia in 1775 and had what became historically known as that First Continental Congress. And they chartered a course to freedom. And they decided in that meeting that they needed to find someone who could give them leadership. They said, we need to find a leader. Someone who understands that we are fixing to go to war and go into battle. Someone who will be willing to lead us. And as they looked, they found a retired Virginia colonel, a tobacco farmer, by the name of George Washington. And they asked him if he would step up and become the general, become their leader, become the leader to lead the troops into battle, become the one to step forward. His response was decisive. Washington said this, and I want you all to listen to this quote because it's so applicable to us in this country today. He said, under these circumstances, can a virtuous man hesitate in his choice? Under these circumstances, can a virtuous man even hesitate in his choice? And did he choose? Yes, he did. He decisively said, I will. He stepped forward. He decided to lead us. And if you study George Washington, you will see that he was willing to sacrifice his very life and everything about himself for those founding days of our country. Amen. Amen. Today, I want to tell you folks, there is a drumbeat of war across this land, across our country. There is a drum beating war. And in this war, there are no harbors to protect. There are no tree-lined ridges we have to defend. There are no physical battlefields that we have to make sure the enemy doesn't take over. But there is the drumbeat of war across our land. The enemy is close at hand. As a matter of fact, the enemy has infiltrated much across our country. The war is the war for the family. And the war for the family is raging across this land today. Last year I spoke with you about the family, God's will for the family, God's plan for the family, what the Bible says about the family. I shared with you the importance of rallying together and doing the right things. And these last few weeks in our Operation Heal America Revival Series, we've been talking about bringing revival to our country, bringing revival to our land and to our home, how God has called us to humble ourselves, how God has called us to pray and how to pray, how has, He has uh, asked us to seek His face, to seek the Lord, and to turn from our wicked ways or repent of our sins. And the Lord convicted me on sharing one more service with you in this Revival Series before before we close it out with talking about how God would and you'll be able to heal a revived America. And the message goes hand in hand with that series that I did on the family last year. I believe God has called us in this revival series to search our hearts, to search our souls on where we stand on a family reformation. A family reformation on reforming our families to what God and His Word intended them to be. The battlefield to grit today is the human heart. And may I tell you today, now listen to me. 
The outcome of this war, listen, the outcome of this war is the destiny of America and it's the destination, uh, the destiny of civilization as we know it, on a broader sense. Because let me tell you, and we've seen this, you might not agree with this statement, but as we look around and at the world, we see that these things are true, that basically, um, as goes America, so goes the world. This country's civilization impacts world civilization, uh, civilization more than any other country in existence today. I was never more reminded of that than when I heard the story. Uh, this was um, a preacher went over to the country of Albania back in 1991, just after they had lifted communism. And uh, I remember some of the names of the story. There was a, a, a little a Dutch woman named Josina Blau who opened up a way with the cabinet of ministers of that newly formed coalition there in Albania. And uh, they were able to get that preacher in. And he started through her as the translator talking to to that newly formed coalition about what we would like to do in this country. And the president or the prime minister, however you would like to call him, the leader, does, he says to the preacher, well, what, what would you like to do? And the preacher said, well, we'd like to come in and work in your orphanages, but really our main goal is to bring Jesus Christ into this country, to bring our God into this country. And that prime minister said something to me, and it was convicting, it was convicting, and then it should be true. But it has long lost its savor. And, and that prime minister said, Ah, yes, we have heard of your God in America. Your God is what made America great. He said, We do not know your God, but we need your God in Albania. It was convicting and then it should be true, but it was not because they needed the God that brought America into existence. Yes. But they do not need the God of America today because the God of America today is not Almighty God. The God of America today is the God of pleasure. The God of America today is the God of humanism. The God of America today is the God of self. Can we stop that door from closing, please, D'Artagnan? I want to suggest to you today that the family, that your family... And my family is on the line. And at this crucial time, we seemingly lack two things. First, we lack volunteers who are willing to stand up and take a stand on the offensive. And secondly, we don't have a clear battle plan. We don't have a clear strategy on how we're going to save our families. I bet by large, if I would say to you, um, do you want to save our families? I bet by large that you know people would say, well, absolutely. If I say, would you like to keep our families from destroying themselves and from being completely obliterated and falling apart? I bet most of you would say yes. But we very seldom have, seldom have a clear strategy how that's going to happen. We've been talking in our revival about the terms of Second Chronicles 7.14 and the war raging across our country. How many of you can quote it by now? We've been saying it week after week after week. How many of you can quote that? Quote that with me. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. We've been talking about strategy, and I'm going to get more specific about strategy today. I want to ask you something today. Does biblical truth really matter to you today anymore? Does biblical truth really matter anymore to you today? Does what the Bible says really make any difference to you today? I remember an expression I heard a few years back. The expression was, there are some things that I would fuss about, but I wouldn't fight about. Some things I would fight about, but I wouldn't die about. And then there were some things that I would die for.
Um, I was just thinking about that expression, about uh, things in this world today. Some things that I would fuss about or that I wouldn't fight about. I'm sure I could ask all of you, and there would probably be a different answer on everyone. I was thinking about some of that in my own personal life. I would fuss about um, our president shutting down the pipelines and making our gas prices skyrocket three times from what they were um, before he was in office a year ago. I would fuss about how my oil prices have skyrocketed and how I can barely afford to even get into work and almost my entire paycheck seems like it's just going to pay for the gas to get to work. I wouldn't fight about that, but I would fuss about it. There are some things I'd fuss about. I won't fight about it, but I'd fuss about it. Um, some things I would fight about. I was trying to think of something that I might fight about. Well, I would fight about taking a stand with other conservative leaders and politicians and, and um, pastors about the open and affirming lifestyle of the church today and accepting the LGBTQ movement and the transgender identity into church circles and saying it's okay when the Bible clearly says it's not okay. That is something that I would stand up and fight about. I wouldn't die for that, but I would fight for that. Well, I was thinking of something that I would really die for. And I would die for my family. And I would die to protect my family. And I would die for my Savior. I really don't think there's any way you could convince me to renounce my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe everything within me that I would die for my Savior. I would die for those things. And I want to challenge you today. What would you be ready to fuss about? What would you be ready to fight about? Does biblical truth really matter? The question is this. Um, who is going to walk, uh, who is going to wage the war on the family's behalf? Who is going to fight this war? I want to tell you today the reality is that there is no elected official that is going to step up and fix all of this mess that we have in America. Regardless of how midterm elections go and regardless of how the next elections go, no elected official is going to step up and be able to fix all of this mess. No noble-minded uh, noble school superintendent is going to be able to turn the public school system around. It's just not going to happen. No social or economic policy is going to save America. The solution for our moral and spiritual crisis in America begins in our own souls and in our own homes. The reformers today must be Christian men and Christian women, Christian husbands and Christian wives, Christian fathers and Christian mothers who are committed to repentance, who are committed to purity, who are committed to parenting, and who are committed to biblical roles on a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, a male and a female, and are committed to doing what God's word says. Mom and dad, no one on this earth has more influence over the family than you do. No one on this earth has more influence over your children and your family than you do. Mom and dads are the influence. The hope for our family, the hope for our church, the hope for our country, the hope for our society is Jesus Christ and his soldiers are you and me. Now listen. If Jesus Christ can't use us as soldiers, he doesn't have any other plan. He's not going to send angels down to be his soldiers. He's not going to do that. He's not going to create another being to come and be his soldiers. He has called us to be his soldiers. Paul said to Timothy over and over again, Timothy, rise up, endure, be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. 2,500 years ago in the land of Turkey, which back then was called Persia, there was a young man working for a king, and that king's name was Artaxerxes. That young man was a cupbearer for the king. What that meant was that it was his job to grab the king's cup and taste that cup to see if there was any poison or anything in it before the king actually would drink it, so it would kill him rather than the king. And the name of that young man was Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah chapter 1 tells us all about that. If you have your Bibles, please turn over to the book of Nehemiah. 
if we're reading in Nehemiah chapter 1, we see that there were some travelers who had traveled to Jerusalem and came back to Persia. And they came and they said to Nehemiah, they said, we went to Jerusalem, and they torn all the walls down around the city, and they're destroyed. They said, it's horrible, Nehemiah. You wouldn't believe how, how awful everything has been torn down, how it's all been destroyed. They said, you wouldn't believe what's happened to our homeland. <coughs> Excuse me. They said, it would break your heart to see it, Nehemiah. Everything is torn down. Not only that, they said... In addition to the walls being torn down, all of the Jews have been victimized by this hellish culture. We can put ourselves in here today in place of the Jews and in place of the walls of Jerusalem. Put the church in there. Think about it on a personal level. The walls are the defenses we have around our home. He said, um, we had, they had been victimized by this hellish culture. It's an incredibly bad situation. They said, not only that, there is a total reproach of our people, isn't there? There's a total reproach of Christians today and our countrymen. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 describes those things. Verses 4 through 11, without reading it, Nehemiah, what he did, the first thing he did, and it may seem pretty simplistic to you, and, but it's, it's a principle that I've pri been trying to get through to you in our entire um, Operation Heal America revival and in our family series that we did last year. And, and, and the first thing Nehemiah did, and what I don't want to happen, is some of you, it's going to sound so simple that you're just going to turn me off right now because it, it, it sounds so simple and what it is. But this is what Nehemiah did. The first thing he did is he went and he fasted and he prayed. The first thing he did is he went to God and asked God to intervene and do something about it. Then he repented of his sins personally. Then he repented for the sin of his country. He repented for all of his brothers and sisters' sins. He repented for the sins of the Jews, his brethren. He repented for them personally. He repented for them um, corporately. And he confessed sin. And he asked God for help. And then with holy boldness in chapter 2, I'll just read it to save time. You can read along. Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, verse 5. With holy boldness, it says, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. He said, Hey, king, I've served you faithfully. If it would be pleasing to you, if I could get your permission and blessing, I'd like to do something about my city. And in verse 17, he gets there, and he sees the people, and he challenges the people. To, he says to him, Let's get Get up and let's build and let's save our city and let's save our country and let's save our families. Let's get up and let's do something about it. And the word of God says, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 18. Then I told them that the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's words which he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Two things move me about this story. I want to talk to you about these two things, and then I want to share with you and discuss for a few minutes just about this. The first thing was, the two things that moved me about this story was Nehemiah's determination and his courage. Nehemiah was determined. He had a plan. He had a goal. This is what we need to do. We need to build the city. We need to build it back up. We need to get it back to where it was. We need to rebuild that foundations. And he had courage. He had courage to go off and do that. Sorry. Sorry about that. He knew what he needed to do, and, and he was determined to do it, and he had courage. Would you agree with me today that Nehemiah had courage yeah. Yeah. to go and do this? Nehemiah had courage. He was courageous to say to the king, let me go. He was courageous, courageous to step over the broken down rubble where the walls that once stood were torn down. He was courageous to stand where the enemies of God were. And he was courageous to say to the people, he said to the people, hey, 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 God's with me. God's with us. Let's rise up. Let's build. Let's salvage this thing. He was a man of determination and courage.
I spoke to you several times during our family series about having courage when it counts. I'm not going to get into that again. Um, the sermons are online. You can go and watch them. Uh, the second thing, the Nehemiah, he, he didn't just have determination. He had a strategy and he, a strategy for how to rebuild that wall. I believe many times the reason we, uh, we have errors in our Christian life and why we can't do these things in our Christian life is because we may have zeal, we may have that desire to do something for God, but we lack the knowledge or the understanding or the wisdom on, on what to do or how to do it. And we need, need to have a strategy on what we're going to do and how to do it. Nehemiah had a strategy. His strategy was this. He said, we need teamwork. It's going to take all of us working together to, to turn these things to make a difference in these projects. Now, I want you to look at Nehemiah chapter 3. I want you to see something. I want you to see a key phrase. I'm going to read through some of these things. He says, now we're all going to do this. Now, I want you to see specifically how he says we're going to do it. I'm just going to read to you a few of these verses. Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 10. And next to them repaired Jediah, the son of uh, Narumph, even over against his house. Verse 23. After him repaired Benjamin and Hushab over against their house. After him repaired Azariah, the son of Masiah, the son of Ananiah, by his house. Verse 28, And above the horse gate repaired the priests, everyone over against his house. Verse 29, After them repaired Zadok, the son of Immer, over against his house. Verse 30, After him repaired Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zelaph, another piece. After him repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. Do you see a common thread that links all of these together? Do you see something that links over together? You know where all of them built? At their own house. At their own home. You know there's a big difference between working on your house and working on someone, else, someone else's house, isn't there? There's a big difference when you're doing something for yourself than whether you're doing it for someone else. Any of you who have ever had an apartment and rented out to tenants know what it's like when people don't really care for your stuff as if it was theirs. It makes a difference. See, when, it, when it's your house, you make sure the material's just right. You make sure everything's done just right when it's working on your place. Nehemiah had a strategy. His strategy was this. I can get everybody working right at their own home. And if everybody will just do that, we'll build this wall, we can get it back up, if everybody will build right at their own home. You know what his great motivation was? What their great motivation was? They were protecting their own home. They were protecting your own home. You know where family reformation begins and revival begins? Listen, folks. Family Reformation doesn't begin in Ithaca, up in College Town, uh, with all of those um, hellistic churches and all of that junk that's going on up there. Family Reformation does not start up there. Um, I could uh, say Family Reformation doesn't start at that strip club down in Elmira, but uh, I, I could ask what the name of that is, but too many of you might know it, so uh, I'm not going to do that. That's not where Family Reformation begins. You know, our family reformation begins in our own homes and in our own house. That's where it begins. One family at a time. I'm going to share something with you, a list, and then I'm going to talk with you just about, I only have enough time to talk about two of these points, and I'll have to close for the day. I wrote down a list of seven bricks. Seven bricks of family reformation we need to use in rebuilding the wall. I'll give you the list, then I'll talk about just two. The first one, we need Christian families who stand on the word. Brick number two, we need churches who stand for conservative Christian values and principles, who stand for biblical truth, who don't water it down with liberal and transgender and LBGDQ agenda.
Third, although some preachers might disagree with me, I think we need parachurch organizations. I thank, I thank God for people like Dave Reaver. Um, those of you who don't know him, he was that Navy SEAL who got his face and part of his body blown off by a phosphorus grenade in the Vietnam War. And he was a Christian and his, his incredible testimony and how he, he goes around to public schools and talks to kids who are thinking about committing suicide just to share his testimony and to let them know him, you know, you can come through. You can endure. It will be okay in the end. People like that. I thank the Lord for Campus Crusade for Christ, sharing the gospel ministry with people on college campuses, or even radio programs that put Christian media out there, even TV studios like Pure Flix Entertainment, who have those Christian movies that we can watch, how some of them touch our soul, or evangelists like uh, Dr. Jack Van Impey, uh, with the weekly pro, he, the late Dr. Jack Van Impey, he's home with the Lord now, but his weekly pro program Jack Vinaby presents where he would take um, news articles and relate them. Uh, actually, we have a light flickering. It looks like we have a light about to be out. See, Satan's attacking us everywhere today. But he, he would just take, you know, take um, you know, the, um, newspaper articles and share how they related to Bible prophecy and how we're living in the end days. You know, I, I, thankful, I am thankful for people and things like that, though I do believe they should ultimately be servants to the church and the family. Fourthly, I believe one of the bricks that is necessary is Christian education. In Christian schools, Christian colleges, Christian seminaries, anything but the public school. And if your kids attend public school today, I would recommend you get them out and get them into a Christian school. If you can't afford it and you have a heart that's willing to put the, the future of your children before your own desires, I would recommend you consider homeschooling your children. In fact, we have a ministry through the Sword and Trial Revival uh, Fellowship. My wife, Dr. Samantha Spencer, with her um, has her, her doctorate in Christian education. All right. um, we have a homeschool co-op that we help, help families work together to help you get a homeschool going so that you can teach your children at home and get them out of the corrupt public school where they can be in a classroom or homeschool with open teaching about uh, Jesus Christ where we're not ashamed of it. I believe that's a necessary brick in rebuilding the walls of family reformation. Fifth, I believe we need Christian leaders in our workplaces and Christian businesses. Sixth, we need Christian political leaders. This coming election, you better get out and vote for the candidate who stands most for what the Bible says is white, right, and wrong. And if you are a, a professing Christian and you don't vote for that, you are the very person I am preaching to you today. Listen, I'll tell you what. When that election comes around, I'm not going to base who I vote off off what they put on Twitter. I don't have Twitter. I don't follow Twitter. I don't give a rat's patootie what anyone says on Twitter. And all of you hypocrites out there, if you just sat, you, you, you men, the the junk that you talk about with the other men while you're at work and what, you know, locker room talk and everything. You ladies, when you sit around and gossip, and then you're going to criticize those people when you're just as guilty, you know, get off your high horse. We've all done the same things. We all talk. We all say stuff. Even politicians, when they're behind closed doors, they say it. All right. You know, they might not say it because they don't want you to think bad about them, but you all do it. So I'm going to look at whoever is the candidate that stands most for conservative moral beliefs and, and has a conservative moral agenda and that's who I'm going to vote for and if you don't know who to vote for come and ask me and I'll tell you who to vote for that's what I'm going to do seventh and last we need Christian people influencing the media wouldn't that be wonderful and I encourage you when you listen to secular media, try to find ones that seem the closest to the goal be it Newsmax or the Epic Times or whatever these are the seven. Now I'm going to talk about just two of these today, hopefully two. I'm going to start with the first one, brick number one, talking about Christian families building the walls of family reformation. If the home is to last the storms, then we're going to have to build it right. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord builds the house, we're laboring in vain. It says, Unless the Lord keeps the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. In other words, the watchman may just as well go back to sleep. If the Lord's not going to have his hand in it, it's already gone anyway. 
The Lord is the one that is responsible, and it is the Lord that we need in our homes. Now, with that in mind, can I give you just a few things real quick? What are the building materials necessary in building these bricks for our families, for, our, uh, for building our Christian families? If our families are going to lead in Reformation, then what are the necessary building ingredients that go into that mortar, into that brick, and into that block? Some of these are going to seem so redundant. As I said earlier, you might just as well shut me off. But you know, if you do that, you're going to turn off the reality of it being a reality in your life. And so here's the first thing. Number one, we need the building material of prayer in our homes. Do you remember that that um, that uh, thing? Um, or actually, um, did you know that prayer is the single most important thing that you, as a Christian home, can do for your family? In the 1950s, there was a famous expression. Finish it for me. The family that prays together. Stays stays together. The family that prays together uh, prays together stays together. That's reality, folks. The family that amen, the family that prays together stays together. Prayer is absolutely necessary in our Christian families. But wait a minute. Let me give you some statistics. Did you know that less than 8% of Christian couples pray together? Less than 8%. Wait a minute, it gets worse. Less than 5% of Christian families pray together out loud on a regular basis. That's 95% of Christian families. I'm not talking about lost people. 95% of Christian families don't even pray at all. It's no wonder we're in such trouble. Less than 5%. Let me talk to you a little bit about my family. Now, my family, we definitely have not done things perfect, and we have not always been consistent with this. We haven't done everything right. Yes, there's been days that, we, that we've missed, but what we try to do is when we do, uh, do family devotions, how we do it, we, uh, you know, and you don't have to do it this way. This is how we do it. We get everyone sitting around. We pick a chapter out of the Word of God, and we read it to, through together as a family. We start out with me. I read one verse. We go to the next person. They read a verse. The next person, they read a, nurse, a verse. The next person reads a verse, and we go all the way around it, and we continue until we finish that whole chapter. You know what that does? That makes all of us have to read all of the scripture together because we have to keep up to where our place is the next one reading. It makes it so we have to read that scripture. And then we sit together and we pray. And, and what I'll do is I'll just say, does anyone have any prayer requests? And they'll, if they have anything they want to pray about. And then I'll just ask um, someone and we'll, we'll start praying and we'll go around the room and then I will close that out. And we do that together as a family. And I encourage you, oh, I strongly... Parents, I strongly encourage you. You don't have to do it quite that way, but do something together with your family. Prayer is an absolute essential building block. And I'll tell you, I believe with my whole heart that if, let's just say, not that 8%, that 5%, that if every Christian family, everyone who says, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, every Christian family simply started praying together as a family, we'd have a spiritual revival of historic proportions go across our land. I really do believe that. I believe if families prayed together every day, you know what you'd find? Less fighting in the home. It's hard to fight during prayer, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to say, Lord, would you please kill my husband? You know, it's, it's hard to do that. It's hard to fight when you're praying for someone. Pray has a way of shaping things up and allowing love to begin to flow. Hey, and you know what? If our Christian families really started to pray together regularly, the world would perk up. And the world would take notice. They would see the love of God flowing. There needs to be a spiritual and moral awakening, and it needs to begin on our knees.
Second building block, material that needs to go into that, into that block, that brick, that mortar, is uh, building the wall of our Christian homes, is the building material of the Scripture, the Word of God. I heard a quote one time by Adrian Rogers, who at that time was the pastor of Bell, uh, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm paraphrasing. He says, We all complain loudly because they will not allow the Ten Commandments to hang on the walls of our classrooms in the public school. And because they've taken Ten Commandments monuments out of public buildings. But I wonder if anyone in your home could find the Ten Commandments portrayed or displayed anywhere on the walls in your home. I wonder if we could do that. And I would dare say, if I took a poll today, there's probably not much scripture hanging around in our houses. Oh, there's the Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Word of God, openly displayed on the walls, plaques, posters, whatever, so that people, when they come in and you walking by, can look at it and see it, and see scripture daily in your homes. I would challenge you today, we need to let the Word of God become important to us in our homes. I think too many of us would be like the lady. Here's the illustration. Uh, this lady and her family came to church one Sunday, and uh, the following week, the pastor and the assistant pastor decided to visit her house. And, and she sat down with them and said, Oh, we're such wonderful Christians, Pastor. I mean, we love the Lord with all our soul, with all our heart, with all our might. And she's, she's thinking, I'm really going to impress them now. So her two little kids come by, and she says to them, Kids, go get the big book, Mommy and Daddy always read. They left, they came back. The son came back with the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit magazine that was sitting on the back of the toilet in the bathroom. And the daughter came back with the romance novel that was sitting right next to it. And, 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 I, and I, I believe, I'm afraid, parents, that if we send our kids to go get the big book that mom and dad always read, they might not come back with the Bible. Amen? Amen. The Word of God isn't as important to us as it needs to be. Here's another thing. I believe we embrace the Word of God in theory, but are we embracing it in practice? In other words, I think, in theory, I think I could probably get anywhere, everyone in this room to stand up today and say, I believe the Bible. I mean, to say that I believe the Bible is the Word of God. The question is, are we practicing it? I believe as a Christian culture, we are raising a generation of young people who are biblically illiterate. Amen. Biblically illiterate. We give them the weakest paraphrase of the Bible we can do so it's easier for them to read instead of the authorized King James Version in hopes that they might read it once in a while. We've watered it down every way we can instead of making our kids read and memorize and know the Word of God. I thank the Lord for how my wife, Miss Samantha, incorporates Scripture into her homeschool classroom. Our children need to see and absorb the Word of God. I want to give you three brief statements about that. Number one, husbands and fathers must recognize being uh, must renounce not recognize must renounce being passive and take initiative and lead in the home men it's time to quit being spiritual wimps and become spiritual leaders in our home and quit being passive and step up and lead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, Paul says to the church at Corinth, watch or be alert. He says, stand fast or firm in the faith. He says, act like men. I really probably believe he was talking to the men when he said, act like men. And then he says, I, I, actually, I just take that for granted in today's society that when Paul said act like men, that he meant men. He says, act like men, and then he says, be strong. And then he closes, let all your things be done with love. Men, we are to take responsibility for the Word of God in our homes. Families need to read and discuss and imply Scripture in our homes. Out loud. Amen? Amen. I mean, come on, amen, even if you're not doing it. Give me an amen. 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 Louder. Come on. Amen. Amen. There we go. 
You know, you could change today and start doing it. Amen? Yes. We need to take the Word of God. We need to read it together, study it, understand it together. Hey, families, Amen. let's read the book. Amen. You know what got me? <laughs> Amen. Solomon, I was reading the first uh, seven chapters in the book of Proverbs. If you read through the book of Proverbs, you'll see over and over and over again in the first seven chapters, he says, My son, my son, my son, my son, my son, my son, over and over. He's trying to get us to understand something, that the Bible is there for teaching our kids. Mom and Dad, let's read the book out loud and discuss it. Thirdly, can I give you a third building material for rebuilding our families? And I'm going to spend most of our remaining time. I got my watch. I'm trying not to go over. I'm going to spend most of our remaining time here. We need the building material of countercultural living. You say, Preacher, are you going to explain what you mean by that? Absolutely. I'm going to give you an illustration of a story I heard many, many years ago from my old pastor, my church that I used to attend to down in Florida. He said, I remember the story. I made a profound impact on my life. I wrote down most of the details I could remember. How the story went was uh, he said that the place they were living at the time, he was down by the creek. It, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it wasn't a big creek, but it was a fast-moving creek. He was down by the uh, creek cutting up wood. He saw up at his house, his wife was up there, and uh, whatever she was doing, he said up behind the house, they had a little uh, an uphill place they had to go, and then up behind that was Highway 92, a two-lane highway, but a pretty fast-moving highway, and then the other surrounding houses. He said he was down there at the, at the creek cutting up wood, his wife was in the house and and he was down there for two hours of time and during that entire two hours of time their two-year-old son Dustin was unaccounted for Juliet's age she was unaccounted for for two hours of time his wife thought uh, he was down at the creek working with his dad his dad thought he was up at the uh, up at the house with his mom he said he said he remembered coming up to the house and his wife yelled to him and said um, tell Dustin to take his boots off because before he comes in the house and he said okay where is he and she said well he's with you and he said well Donna he's not with me I've been down at the creek and she says well I know he's been down at the creek with you this whole time and he and, and he said Donna he hasn't been with me at all and he said, instantly we had mass panic. He said, we looked all over the house. We couldn't find him anywhere. He said, we began, he, she said, um, he said, my wife was calling the neighbors and they said, comb the woods, Dustin's missing. He said, he went, he went running down to the creek, uh, just imagining if he would find his dead body floating there in the creek. He didn't see him anywhere. He, he went running around the surrounding area. He got driving his car, going up and down, looking for him. He said, Highway 92 was that stretch uphill. He said, I really didn't think a two-year-old would go too far up a hill like that. He said, I really wasn't worried about that, but we couldn't find him anywhere and time went on and on and, and and he started to go through his mind and parents if you've ever been in a situation uh, situation like this have you ever stopped to wonder what am i going to do if he is dead He said that was going through his mind. He said about that time, he turned around and he looked up toward Highway 92 and there was a man frantically running down the hill. And he said he had the hugest fear going through his mind. He went running up the hill and the guy's yelling and he's yelling and the pastor, the pastor he's like, what is it, what is it? And the guy says, do you have a little boy? And, and the pastor says, yes. And the guy says, oh, mister, you're crazy. And the pastor said, What? And the guy said, I almost just hit your little boy right in the middle of Highway 92. Dustin, at two years old, had somehow pushed this little yellow car that he was playing with all the way up the hill through the trees and all the way up that hill. And he was sitting, playing with that car right in the middle of Highway 92. Thank the Lord they missed him. He said he got his son, and for the next few minutes, he sat down with his son and talked to him the danger about being in the middle of the road. In the middle of the road. For this entire Operation Heal America Revival series, you've heard me make that comment before, going back to our family series. I made it back then, trying to get a point across to you. Christians today are trying too hard to be in the middle of the road. That's where we live today. Middle of the road, Christianity. 
That's the place where we found comfort. The point is this, middle of the road is no place to be. Maybe for some of us, we're in a worse place. Some of us aren't in the middle of the road. We're in the wrong lane. We're not even in the middle. We're going the wrong direction. We're not where we're supposed to be. For the past 50-some years, pretty much going back ever since the 1960s, we have been taking our cues from the world instead of the Word of God. Christian culture has been taking its cues from the world instead of the Word of God. Romans chapter 12, you know it. It says, um, um, verses 1 and 2, what does it say? It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what? A living sacrifice. How? Holy and acceptable. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. And what does verse 2 say? And be not what? Conformed to this world. But be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what will happen we are, when we are transformed instead of being conformed to the world, you will prove to the world what is the acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, if we do the right thing and live transformed Christian lives, the world will sit up and take notice and we will prove to them who God Almighty is. When we are not conformed to the world and when we are conformed to the world, we just don't do it. It. So you know what's happened? For the last 50 years, the Christian, uh, the Christian community has had very little salt, very little light, and very little influence. These are some uh, statistics from Dennis Rainey. And these are backed up uh, with media points and prints. He says, children from Christian homes today now watch more BET and MTV and other similar music television stations than children from non-Christian homes. Children from Christian homes now watch more of that than children from non-Christian homes. Evangelical Christians now account for one out of every six abortions today in America. Evangelical, born-again, Bible-believing Christians now account for one out of every six abortions. Does that alarm you? Christian families regularly view ungodly and degrading TV shows and movies today, and they do it with their kids. Over 40% of children in Christian homes aged 10 years old or younger have already gone to an R-rated movie by themselves or with their parents. Does that alarm you? Does that alarm you, folks? 55% of our Christian youth have already engaged in sexual fondling, sexual fondling fondling, or sexual intercourse before they reach the age of 18 years old. 55% of Christian youth have already engaged in some sort of sexual misconduct by the time they reach age 18. Hey, does that alarm you? I'm afraid it doesn't alarm us. Kids in churches today have very tolerant views on divorce. Almost 50% of kids from Christian homes disagree with this statement. If there are children involved in the marriage, the parents should not get a divorce. 46%, almost 50% of kids in Christian homes disagree with that statement. A significant majority of Christian young people are comfortable with contemporary secular definitions of what a family is when considering such as same-sex couples, open marriages, and living together without being married. Two-thirds of Christian kids, when given a choice of four family definitions, two-thirds of them selected this definition. Christian kids a family is a no-risk, no-commitment kind of arrangement. Hey, did you get that? Two-thirds of Christian youth believe that a family is no-risk and no-commitment kind of arrangement. Middle of the road... Looks like we've adopted a world view, not a word view. Middle of the road, maybe that's too generous. We're in the wrong lane. Now, what are we going to do about that? Well, here's what we're going to do. If we're going to have a strategy, here's a strategy. Number one, let's let the scripture set personal standards of holiness. Hey, folks, and you listening online, look here for a minute. Let the scripture 
set personal standards of holiness for your lives. Let me just ask you a few questions. Question number one. Is there anything that you wouldn't do? You say, well, yeah. There's a bunch of stuff I wouldn't do. Well, why? Because I wouldn't get caught. Okay? Let's just say you wouldn't get caught. Is there anything that you wouldn't do if you wouldn't get caught? Is there? Why? Because of the word or because of the world? I want to ask you today, are standards okay? Yes or no? Are standards okay? Yes or no? I mean, come on, folks. Please contribute with me on this. Are standards okay? Yes or no? Yes, yes standards okay. Should we obey the Ten Commandments? Yes or no? Yes. Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 17 are the Ten Commandments. I want to challenge you to read them. I'm not going to read them today due to time. But would you be willing to say that that ought to be a standard that we should have for our families to obey the Ten Commandments? Yes. I want to say to you today, we need to have some personal standards standards of holiness in our homes. Secondly, I want to say to you that we need to have some boundaries. We need to set boundaries in our homes. Write that down if you're taking notes, and you ought to be. Let's send boundaries. Let's have boundaries for our families. And I know what's happening. Some of you are thinking right now, oh great, the preacher's going legalist on us. That's a bunch of bunk. Boundaries are absolutely correct. They are necessities in society, and, or that society will be anarchy. You better have some rules in your family. You better have some boundaries, and you better have some laws in your home and in your land. Did you ever play beach volleyball? Anyone ever played beach volleyball? I used to love beach volleyball. I remember in high school back, we'd get my friends together. We'd go running out to the beach. We'd all have volleyball nets, and we'd get out there. And it took so long to set that stupid volleyball net up and get that thing to stick in the sand. We'd get that beach volleyball net up, and then we'd get up there, and we'd start playing. And what we didn't do was we never took the time to set the out-of-bounds. Did any of you ever do that? You never set the out-of-bounds. And then we'd sit there, and, and I'd serve and hit it, and I'd say, yes, yeah, score a point. They'd say, that's not, that's out. That didn't count. Say, that's that counted. That wasn't out. They'd hit the ball over here. And we'd say, that's out. They'd say, they, that's not out. We'd say, yes, it is. And we'd argue the whole game long. And we didn't enjoy any of it. Any of it. Why? Because we had no boundaries. You know, if we have boundaries... We get to concentrate on the game instead of what's out of bounds. What's out and what's in. Did you know that that same principle holds true for a family? Families, when you don't have boundaries, all you do, all you're going to do is argue. All you're going to do is argue all the time about what's right and what's wrong. You know what you need to do? You need to establish some boundaries. Parents, you are absolutely wrong if you're not raising your kids and giving them any boundaries. You are teaching them everything wrong about the reality of life. They will never do well in the workplace if they don't understand how to follow boundaries in the home. They won't do well in the family relationship. They won't do well in their personal life. Boundaries are absolutely important in life. Okay, I wrote this down in my notes. Your kids are not going to give you a blue star of popularity for this one. And I want to tell you something. God did not call me into life to be my child's friend. Amen. He called me to be my child's hero and mentor and teacher and authority and parent and leader. I'm responsible for my kids. I must do the right thing. Legalism, write that down if you're taking notes. Legalism is boundaries with no love. It only becomes legalist when you lay down the law, but you don't have any love with it. And by the way, parents, if you try to have boundaries without love, I can promise you one thing. Your kids will rebel. Your kids will rebel, I promise you, if you have boundaries with no love. Love is that beautiful ingredient that allows me to be able to put boundaries into their life. So would you like me to give you your boundaries today? Well, the reality is I can't do that. Only you can set your own boundaries. However, I am going to take a step out today.
I'm going to give you some things to pray about. How about that? I'm going to give you some things to pray about. I'm going to ask you some questions. Just some things for you to pray about. Will your children have to learn to look someone in the eye when you're talking to them? You say, Pastor, is that really important? Amen. Very important. That has to do with understanding and submitting to authority. Not being able to be my own in a disregard for everyone else. Will you be willing to break your kids' will as they're growing up? You say, my wife, you say, break their will? I mean, that's the last thing I want. I don't want to do. I don't want to break their will. They're such beautiful little vessels. I want to encourage them to do whatever they want in life. Listen to me. They will not grow up to become beautiful vessels. They will grow up to become ugly vessels if you do not break their will. That's one of the principles in Scripture. You know what the Bible says? If you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Spoil, that word spoil means like we have food that's spoiled. It means it's rotten. It's no good. It's no benefit. That comes from Proverbs 13, verse 24. The hard scripture is a little bit more than that. It says, he, he that spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him chastens him diligently. You know, the Bible even says in the book of Proverbs, if you beat your child, it will not kill him. It does. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. Now listen, I'm not talking about that beating where some of you, you wicked fathers, would come up and punch your kid across the face, give him a black eye and a bloody lip and bust some teeth out, hit him across the head with a beer bottle, punch him in the gut and break his ribs. I'm not talking about that. That's abuse. I'm talking about biblical chastisement on the behind where it's all cushy and nice and so it can recover but that that pain that chastisement every time you find it in the scripture where it talks about sparing the rod it is talking about sparing that spanking proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15 foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him Here's one for you. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. That rod or that spanking and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And the Bible says that that spanking, that discipline, is an important and necessary part of life. Let me ask you this. Will you deny your kids' demands when they're disrespectful? Or will you cave into them? Will you allow your child to give you attitude when they talk to you? No. No. Oh, I'm glad you won't. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you won't allow your children to, attain to, to be disrespectful to you. Mom and Dad, will you allow your child to have a sour attitude and a rotten disposition? And by the way, Mom and Dad, don't say that your children growing up have to have a sour attitude and a rotten disposition. They don't. You can straighten that out. They do not have to have a sour mood. I've had my kids have a sour mood and a rotten disposition. I've had the privilege of straightening that mood out of them on quite a few occasions. Don't you dare think that their personality, that's their personality, and that's the way that they're going to be. Don't let them be that way. Don't allow them to do that. Moving on, those of you who haven't turned me off online, it's getting late for some of you. How much and what kind of TV are you going to allow your children to watch? How about the movies? How about the internet? Hey, here's a novel idea. Are you going to allow yourself to watch the movies you watch? What about the internet internet? you look at or are you going to make the decision to live by the standard do as I say not as I do here's another one will you allow your children to date or biblically court and if so at what age when and with whom will you allow them to single date and, and be alone together or will you insist that they double date and they have or, or have a chaperone and does he have to qualify in order to be able to go out with her absolutely 
And will you interview the person who wants to go out with your son and daughter? Absolutely. You say, come on, preacher, this is 2022. Uh-uh. Absolutely. <laughs> How about this one? Will you, as a Christian, allow your son and daughter to date a non-believer? No. I mean, can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Amen. Here's some other questions just talking about how you allow them in life. Will you allow your kids to wear the grunge look? Or your daughters, will you allow them to wear sexy, sensual clothing where people of the opposite sex, perhaps even older than you are or me, will be able to look at your little girls and lust after them as they see their skin, their legs, and their body? Are you going to care what kind of bathing suit your little girl wears when she's around the boys? By the way, Mom and Dad, if your kid is 17 and you're thinking, you know what, maybe I better address that, you're in a world of trouble. You say, come on, preacher, you, uh, preacher you're nitpicking now. I'm not nitpicking. I'm just giving you some things to pray about. Mom and Dad, family reformations aren't easy. But they're biblically necessary if we're going to save the family. And I'll tell you, the fate of their country and the fate of society hangs in the balance. Because revival in our own homes and in our own hearts, that's where it starts. And a family reformation is the way to get it going. And Mom and Dad, if you'd follow some of the advice that I'm giving you, you won't come to me one day with a broken heart because you didn't listen. What about physical touch? Are you going to let your kids touch wherever they want to and whenever they want to? Are you going to allow them to be alone in their room with the opposite sex? Are you going to challenge them with boundaries and limits and then insist and inspect to make sure that they're following them? Don't trust them when they say, come on, you can trust me. I wouldn't do that. Listen, you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And Christian kid, non-Christian kid, parent, you were a kid once, you were a teenager, you remember what it was like. It's going to be the same for your kids. And if her parents shouldn't have trusted you then, then you better not trust um, their parents with your kid. Amen. That should get an amen. This one's going to be tough. What about the transgender, transgender and the LGBTQ movement? Are you going to allow your children to be caught up in this? I don't care what society says. They were not made that way. There is not 112 different sexes. That is a lie from Satan. God made them male and female. There's only two sexes. He made them to be attracted to the opposite sex. And the Bible says anything else is sin. What is your standard on that with your kids going to be? What are you going to allow your kids to do? You know what? It's very important to set standards and boundaries by the Word of God. I'm almost done. I am almost done. I know I'm pushing it. I'm just about at that hour limit, and I know you're getting antsy. Probably tired of hearing this old, um, you know, this, you know, hearing me bray and yell around back up here. It is very important to set standards and boundaries by the Word of God in my children's lives and in your children's lives. And until we do that, we will not have families that make a difference for God. You say, uh, I can say to you, does that sound strict? Preacher, I think you're being too strict. Don't talk to me about strict. That sounds safe. That to me sounds safe. Don't talk to me about being strict. Talk to me about being safe. I'm going to protect Juliet. I'm going to protect Scarlett. I'm going to protect D'Artagnan. I'm going to protect Colin. I'm going to protect them with my life. My children are the most important responsibility I have in life. More important than you listening online. More important than this church. My older five, Jeannie, David, Kaylin, Matthew, and Kendallin, they're on their own now. Some of them married with their 
their families and have families of their own. And it is now their responsibility and their burden to take what I have raised my kids the way that I raised my kids to the Lord. It is now their responsibility as well. And it's yours also listening online and, and those else in here. And I don't know how you feel, Mom and Dad, but I'm willing to be unpopular with anybody to honor God with raising my kids, even if I need to be unpopular with my own kids. Maybe just once in a while. Amen. Just once in a while. I'm willing to be unpopular once in a while. I know your time's up. I had more. I know I'm out of time. The last thing and I close. I want to ask you today, are you willing to have a family reformation and say, Brother Scott Spencer, we want a family reformation. We're going to have a family that's going to obey God. We're going to have a family that's going to live for God. We're going to have a family that prays. We're going to have a family that reads Scripture. We're going to have a counter-cultural relationship. We're not going to follow the world. We're going to follow the Word. We're going to have mentors that, that set spiritual examples for our kids. We're going to set some boundaries. We're going to do it. We're going to follow God. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed. No one looking around. First off... It's hard to have any kind of a family reformation if you're not even saved. So the first thing I'm going to say is, by the upraised hand and testimony, would there be anyone who would say, Brother Scott, I am a Christian. I know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know the Lord. Would you raise your hand? And just as a public acknowledgement, say, I know the Lord. God bless you for those hands. God bless you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Is there anyone who would say, Brother Scott Spencer, you know, um, some of this stuff, it's a little convicting. Some of this stuff, you know, maybe I'd like to do this stuff. But first thing, you know, I, I think I might like to get Jesus Christ in my life and I might like to know the Lord. Would there be anyone up, raise his hand, say, you know what, I, Brother Scott, will you just pray for me? I'd like to know the Lord. I'd like to get that settled in my heart and my life. I'd like to know the Lord. Would there be anyone like that here today? Would there be those of you online who would say, Brother Scott, I'd like to know the Lord. You know, it's hard to have any kind of a change. And you're not going to have a family reformation for God if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So for those of you out there online listening to me, or those of you in here who are too, um, and you, you were just a little bit concerned and didn't want to raise your hand. I'm going to pray. And if you pray out loud, you don't have to pray out loud, but if you pray at home in, or in here, you pray in your heart, I'm going to pray. If you would like to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can, just, you can say this right in your seat. You can just pray after me. Now, get, now listen to me. God did not say if Scott Spencer would pray for you, he'd save you. But he said if you'd pray, he'd save you. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray in your heart. And if you mean it with an obedient and a repentant heart and you want to be saved and you want to call upon the name of the Lord and confess and repent your sin and ask him to save you, he'll do it. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. But I know you died on Calvary's cross to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I just ask you now to forgive me, Lord, for all of these sins that I've done. I ask you, Lord Jesus, Lord, I, I, I want to make a change I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference in my family. I want to have a relationship with you. I repent of my sins. I'm going to place them under the blood and ask you to forgive them as you did when you paid for them on Calvary's cross. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Please forgive me of my sins. Save me now. I pray in Jesus' name and just for his sake. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that and you meant that, then God would come into your heart and save you because He promised He would. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He can save you today. Would any of you say, Sorry, put your heads all back down. I wasn't done yet. <laughs> would any of you say with an upraised hand, I, we, need a family reformation? Our family just isn't, isn't going quite the right way, Brother Scott, and I'd like you to pray for us. Would anyone raise their hand and say, we need a family reformation in our home. I want our home to make a difference. I want to make a difference in my kids' lives. Would any of you say that? Would you just raise your hand and say, I need, I need a family reformation. Whenever you're online, I'm going to pray for that. But if you 
have made that decision in your home, you need a family reformation. I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, we live in a horrible, terrible time in life. Sin is everywhere. The devil has virtually seems like he's won. Although I know he hasn't, because I've read the last chapter of this book. I know what comes in, and I know he gets his in the end. I know that I'm on the willing, winning side. But Lord, there are families out there, and even my family, God, I don't do everything perfect. Heaven knows I've got some trouble with some of my, uh, my children who are grown and gone. They're, they're just away from God. And, and, and you know, heaven knows, Lord knows that things just haven't always gone the right way. Lord, so I just pray for families out there who would be listening to this service and would like to have that family reformation. Dear God, I just pray that you would be with them and help them be able to confess and repent of sin and make those decisions that they're going to start praying together as a family, the number one building block. Number two, that they're going to get the scripture into their homes and read scripture and get into the Bible and start putting the word of God into their lives and praying in their lives. Dear God, and I pray that you would help them to make that break from the culture and read the word, understand what the word says, and then start raising their children the way that the word of God, the way that you, through your word, told us how to do it. Lord, I pray for those families, God, that you would just be with them. As, as we finish our very last week of our revival series, before we talk about what would happen with a revived America that you could bring to us if we do your terms that you have outlaid for us, Lord, I just pray, dear God, that you would be with our families. Help us to get this right. Help us to make a decision that we're going to change the way we're doing it, that we're going to have a family reformation. I ask these things in Jesus' name and just for his sake. Amen. I would like to thank all of you for joining us today at the Sword and Trial Revival Fellowship and those of you who joined us online. I pray that you will be with us for our next service and that you continue to come and, and, and be with us online or in person. I pray that God will be with you as you go on your way. May God just bless you in your life. Take care. God bless.